All right. So, question. What is urban renewal? Changing gears here. We're going to have all law stuff on the line. What's urban renewal? Oh, yes, but I think more physical space right now. How do we know? Any idea? Um, oh, the reading's like two or three weeks ago. Is that updating uh, the area? The oh, what type of development can we do? We can. Do land development from scratch. Green flat space. Yeah? yeah. Alright. What, what are you going to do if land is running out and you have no more flat green space? Build up. You build up. Oh, what are you going to do with construction of uh, structures that are already on place? Change. Get rid of them. You change them. Oh, yeah. Get rid of them. You demo, you demo them. Yeah? Demo as in kaboom. Yeah? So, what else? If you do it with one parcel, huh? yeah. or two or three small parcels, that's what we <coughs> call the chic way of infill redevelopment. Huh? Take out one or two homes, put two or three units, as a, let's say duplexes in there. Increase density, still keep that kind of little family home style in a duplex. Huh? What does urban renewal mean for us as property management folks? If I take out something and put something new in that place... Increase in cost. I increase density. What is for property management? What is good for us? Density. Yeah, because now I actually I have another tower with maybe tenant, rest, condos or tenants in there and I make sure that I am going to get that contract for those 150 units. Yeah. So urban renewal is not a bad idea, is it? No. Sounds good to me. Would you agree? As a skeptical maybe. Why is it a skeptical may maybe? I don't know. It's not a view, I mean. Well it says pros and cons, so it's probably cons. <laughs> Pro and cons. <laughs> What do I say about our land development all the time? Say it. What do I keep saying about development? It's ever changing. It's all changing, and what else? It depends on the scale. Huh? If I do two or three parcels, call it infill development, I might get lucky with it. Awesome. What if I take all downtown? Yeah. What if, if I take all the buildings in a low-income neighborhood also risky. Very risky. and rebuild it with the state of the art in my Turkish and temporary design? Historically, we just created the projects. Rebuild few things, put new design on it. That design might not be socially inclusive the way we want it to be. No? So keep that in mind, scale is important. When we do urban renewal, sure, combine that half acre and the other half acre lot and put nice little development on it. Yeah? If you bulldoze half of Davy down, you have a problem. Let's take a look at it. Historic context. You ever been to Philadelphia? Yeah. This can be urban renewal. 
Then we have this. Um, I'm running two screens right now, which is why it's a little bit. Sometimes, darkness comes from unexpected places. J.K. Holmes, Harry Potter. In 1950, Philadelphia's oldest neighborhoods were caught in a spiral of abandonment and decay. As residents flocked to the suburbs, the brick row houses and crowded marketplaces of the old city faded into the shadows of a disappearing past. But urban planners were reimagining cities, and these historic blocks would soon become laboratories for change. created by the federal government after the Second World War because there was a broad national consensus that our cities need help. Federal money coming from Washington managed locally. It became a tool that city planners could use to recreate whole sections of the city. City streets would be the planner's canvas. The Philadelphia of the future made possible through relocation, demolition, rehabilitation, eminent domain, and money. Development director William Rafsky made urban renewal a cornerstone of the city's political reform movement, while Edmund Bacon, director of the City Planning Commission, led the charge. Not everything is Philadelphia is the singular Bacon. case where the city planning director became the face of the urban renewal movement. Bacon had a real gift for speaking to journalists, business people, understanding a different way to reach politicians and elected officials. He was a real salesman uh, and marketer. But Bacon's combative approach proved controversial. Ed Bacon was theoretically aware of communities, but he said, don't ask the community to generate something because they just don't know. I know what ought to be. Urban renewal was in some ways the first chapter in contemporary gentrification. The area becomes transformed. It becomes wider, it becomes more affluent, it becomes more middle class. There were dynamic communities of black people, working class white folk who were, in, in short, pushed out. In the heart of Philadelphia's historic district, the neighborhood of Society Hill had long been the working class backbone of the city's port. Named for William Penn's Free Society of Traders, it contained the city's main produce market, and it bustled with the families of African American and Irish laborers. Society Hill was a deteriorated neighborhood. Broken containers, barrels full of fish and things like that were all over the place. We had the Blue Anchor Inn, which was frequented for the most part by foreign sailors, including some ladies that worked the area. This was not exactly a pretty place. Bacon's office devised a plan to transform the old neighborhood. It would have been very easy to have come in and torn it all down. What Bacon imagined, though, was a combination of the new and the old. We had a plan for Dock Street, which we had to demolish. Those buildings were too far deteriorated to build a high-rise apartment project to get the kind of density we thought we needed. Bacon selected acclaimed modern architect I.M. Pei to design the centerpiece of the renewal, Society Hill Towers, which broke ground in 1963. Mayor Richardson Dilworth built a home for his family on nearby Washington Square, and Bacon designed a network of greenways, creating pedestrian pathways between streets. The old Philadelphia Development Corporation marketed the idea of living in a restored colonial village to families that uh, had an ancestry that dated back to the colonial period. The first couple of buyers we had were Jared Ingersoll and his wife, uh, 
who was a very famous Philadelphian, and Henry Watts, who was the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange. I bought a house on Third Street. People who were young, like my husband and myself, we moved in because we could do a lot of the houses ourselves and we built those houses, we rebuilt them. It was like a Vermont village. Everybody got together, everybody knew everybody. And then as it got more and more built up, it became more stratified. South Street and Lombard Street, when I was real little, they were black neighborhoods. By the time I got to be a teenager, there was the, the first gentrification wave was Society Hill. And the blacks who lived on Lombard Street were, were gone. Then it moved over to South Street, a kind of erasure. City policy brokers did not consult with the very people that were being removed from their homes. Everyday people feeling like they didn't have control or say over their lives over where they lived, where they could send their kids to school. Many are the sins of urban renewal, but society will became the model all around the country for how to revive city neighborhoods, not through demolition, but through preservation. In the space of two decades, Society Hill became one of Philadelphia's wealthiest neighborhoods. At the same time, Bacon's planning office guided urban renewal efforts throughout the city. All right, let's stop this one here. So you get the message. They really, really went in there with a big eraser and remodeled, not considering the consequences that it has on the social lives and impact on social life. Vibrant neighborhood. Yeah? Um, old sins we need to be aware of make better places today. Yeah? So same thing if you do development now in Miami or in Philadelphia, you gotta have an idea of okay if you put this out, who might come and who might has to leave. Yeah? The whole process of gentrification is a huge problem. Yeah? Um, Flagland Village. Everyone like, oh years ago it was like a bad area, bad neighborhood. There's still at corners of that area where you're like, oh, don't like it. But with the new development Property prices and rental prices are going up. Yeah? It will push people out. Certain folks will not be able to maintain their cost of living there. Or if you work in a hotel, you might have to commute hours to get to the hotel because the money you make is an example of Delaware years ago. But we all will beach, beautiful beach resort, beautiful great hotels, but the staff in the hotel can't afford to live in in that city anymore because of the prices. Gotta move out, gotta commute in. You know? Comes back to the transit option for the problem. I have one more different one more example. Slightly different. Sydney is Australia's great global city with its breathtaking natural beauty and unparalleled harbour waterfront. Yet only two kilometres from Sydney's CBD, there's a unique opportunity for an exciting and visionary urban renewal. Urban Growth New South Wales will lead this transformational revitalisation, comprising Blackwattle Bay, home to the Sydney fish markets, Roselle Bay and Rail Yards, and the White Bay Power Station. The Bays will be an iconic destination that beckons the world. The White Bay Power Station is one of the city's most remarkable heritage buildings due to its raw industrial spaces and its role as an important landmark. The White Bay Power Station is in need of significant revitalization and will act as a catalyst for urban renewal. The Bay's urban renewal team will lead the transformation of Blackwattle Bay into a vibrant marketplace, catering for locals and tourists. We are now at the cusp of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for government, community 
and the private sector to work together. The Bay's urban renewal will re-energise and revitalise Sydney for all Australians. social implications of my development. Yeah? I just could be totally dumb and do what I think would be great and it doesn't work in that community. Yeah? Because I'm completely disconnected. Which is great because what do I keep saying about communications when you talk about real estate developer and planner? We gotta communicate with those guys. Yeah? You also need to be boots on the ground when it comes to property management, of course, but also real estate development. When you do redevelopment or renewal, yeah, you got to talk to your neighbors. you got to talk to the people in the community. Yeah? got to be available in what's the common sense on the street. That said, I'm actually doing a groundbreaking ceremony tomorrow morning with some of my alumni. Uh, putting a new concept out. Really cool little thing. They did a ton of talk about how they rearrange the trees in their property or not. Yeah? They did a ton of talk with the community about the second access to the property for firefighters. They thought about a pass-through. Now they put a gate up so there is no additional traffic backing into the existing community. Yeah? So the apartments have one big main entrance really nicely guided in the, in the main street but for emergency services and evacuation routes firefighters have a special key at least that was the update last time I saw the site plan yeah. so urban renewal you are restructuring social fabric not just physical space yeah. if you look at let's say the Brightline station formerly known as Brightline station in Miami Central yeah, you're redeveloping social fabric as well. If you look at spaces like Candle, like Weston, Plantation, every development is changing. Mako Hall. Who has been in other dorms on campus? Did you move to Mako Hall or are you staying in the current one? We are forced to move to Mako Hall. You forced move to Mako Hall? You got forced move into granite tabletops? Yes. <laughs> uh, I did not know. But um, different change in scenery, different setup. Maker Hall, the new dorms, is changing the lifestyle and the cultural environment on campus. Huh? First of all, you have to walk a little bit longer to the food court. It's a mile from it's not that complicated. It's a mile from here. It is a healthy lifestyle. <laughs> Do I need a healthy lifestyle? I, it's a healthy lifestyle. It's okay. I was just waiting until the first electric scooters show up on campus. Yeah? I, I haven't seen it. The amount of skateboarding and bicycling on this campus is so north of the student union building very little. In front of the library? No. I would, I'm surprised. I've seen electric scooters here and there, you see when you go to the web page or you open up your app and you find them. It's actually interesting where they're spreading out, the little lemmings. That's really fun. For me, for a mapping guy, oh, Snapchat, too complicated for me to deal with Snapchat. I like the heat map where you can see the steps. That's really cool mapping. Okay, fine. Come and distract it. Um, uh, yeah, see, scooters. Our consideration of change walking, biking, scooters. We had the shark cage, we had golf carts as an uh, idea, once, yeah. idea, like a golf cart shuttle service across campus. Thank you. Yeah? you How awesome would that be? You're, you're, <laughs> you're a medical student living in Maker Hall and someone gives you a, 
gives you a shopping, uh, shopping cart, a, yeah, a, a golf cart ride. Yeah? Scooters could come. Um, I have a friend who considered buying a home close by, like across the street in the golf course area. I'm like, so what are you going to do? Go and take an electric scooter instead of a car? And he's like, yeah, maybe. Uh, a friend in San Francisco, that's how he commutes. Electric scooter to the bus stop, takes the scooter into the bus, and the last, the last mile, half mile to the aquarium, he's on the scooter again. All right, it's a uh, virtual aquarium of the bay there. Huh? So think about that. Ooh. How does a community improve walkability? This is urban planning. I try to mix up life a little bit. Walkability years. affects community health, economics, and the overall livability of a town. It is not just about being physically able to walk somewhere, but about all the things that influence your choice to take care of daily activities on foot. 400 meters, or a quarter mile, is the distance the average person can walk in five minutes. When a trip becomes longer, people choose other, more convenient ways of getting around. But we cannot just judge walkability with a straight line measurement. Separated land uses, dead-end streets, large blocks, and poorly designed and arranged developments can mean that many places are undesirable or unsafe to walk through, or more than five minutes away. By changing some of the ways we build our neighborhoods and towns, we can make them more walkable. The following are three ways of doing just that. One, arrange the uses in your community so that people can get to many of them on foot. Put neighborhood convenience stores, daycares, and parks in the heart of residential areas. And make sure these are connected to main downtown commercial districts. And don't make blocks too large, or at least include safe, well-designed shortcuts through them. Two, focus on placemaking. That means making destinations people-oriented and interesting by mixing a variety of uses and designing spaces for different kinds and ages of people. And remember, all trips start and end as walking trips, so even include safe walkways through parking lots. And three, make your neighborhoods and districts pleasant for people to walk through with streets, buildings, and landscaping that are all designed to focus on people's experiences. This doesn't have to be complicated. Placing buildings close to the street, avoiding blank walls, and including street trees along sidewalks are some of the most universally effective ways to make a community more pedestrian friendly. With these simple long-term policy goals and land use decisions, and basic design and development solutions, you and your elected officials, municipal planners, and builders can work together to improve your community's walkability. I'm Robert Voigt, and this has been Urban Planning One. Good. Let's talk about walkability. Huh? So take a look. Take a look at this. This is part of the. Um, your professor took random pictures on a trip, and you have to analyze the picture to learn something. Huh? Hashtag. That's a long hashtag. I try to make this a little bit less suffering for you guys after eight o'clock. Uh, less suffering. Yeah. Suffering. Imagine this at eight a.m. in the morning. Oh my God! I would bring donuts. Huh? <laughs> Alright, so Heidelberg, Germany. Everyone who has a laptop in front of you guys, find that place. It's amazing. It's one of the most beautiful little towns you want, want to visit when you go to Germany. Place making, place branding. Forget Munich, do this town. Be as the same awesomeness, people are more, way more friendly. Less lederhosen, different state. Alright, so this is kind of the lead in with walkability. I try to cross over a little bit here from the planning law thing into a little bit more to the land development and the ideas of how to create vibrant neighborhoods. Apparently, we walk a lot. Huh? What do you see in this picture right now? Bicycles. Bicycles. What else? There's a right there. Ah, I see a subway. This is a little alley. <laughs> Think about this. If you would walk from the main, from the atrium, yeah? to the exit, passing the, the, the bathrooms downstairs. And you turn left and you see the other hallway where the uh, student information services are and the night editorial goes. You walk this way, <coughs> you look, oh, what's that? That is the picture. This is the alley. As you look at the people and how wide this is. This is bicycle stand, one bicycle, middle of the road, one bicycle, you're done. 
That's a subway. Those are high traffic uh, retail uses, subways. A subway is not going to stay somewhere, uh, work, uh, place the location there where there's not enough traffic, not enough purchasing power. Yeah? Well, that's the reason why they have that. Uh, see an old church in the background, red sandstone. Yeah? Really funny pattern on the street of so walking. Yeah? Then I see this. It's a bookshelf. Open little public library. No one can't check your um, uh, your transaction, your library card or not. Let's just pick one, bring it back. Good old common sense behavior. So here's a fun story. This is a little bit older, this picture. Yeah? Uh, June 2013. Really cool trip. With a friend of mine from Greece. Um, met, met in Cincinnati. He works in Frankfurt. We are like, hey, come, come together. Yeah? Back in town, visiting. Let's meet in Heidelberg. 20 minutes drive for him in the local train. Really cool connection. Again, you meet people worldwide, internationally, while you're in college, stay in contact with them. Yeah? Do that. It's awesome. Open library. Then you talk about how do you do libraries in rural regions where you don't have people anymore, where the next little village of 50 buildings is an hour drive time. Well, some people came up with library buses. Yeah? Put an old school bus, renovate this whole thing, put library shelves in there. And once a week you drive through, people know on Friday at 4 p.m., library bus is there. Bring my books back, get new books out. Maybe with the internet, order that book so they have it on the shelf for you. Different deliveries. Yeah? We talked at Shark Cage about getting your textbooks delivered to the door. Mm -hmm. Same concept. So, really cool lady actually checking out those books, you know, and the, the flyers and posters on there. Showed that to a grad student. Gives me the spec. <laughs> <laughs> Random drive by in Boca. As in, hey, saw this in your lecture, reminded me about it, took a picture. So, take pictures. I kicked the, out, the other one, I think I kicked out this today. Little, little newsstand box, library, huh? even with an earl. Really cool. All over the place in the nation now, stuff like this. Built a small, almost like a birdhouse, put a few books in, people might like it. Depending where you're at, homeowner association might not like it. Yeah. So, but I find this really cool. So we do, let's go back to Heidelberg. Again, this is main, one of the main street pedestrian souls there. Speaking of walking, there's zero car, only bicycle, and everyone was walking to that little church plaza here. Yeah? How do we read places? First place, or first floor, retail. Yeah? was clearly residential use. Huh? Then you walk by here, this is by the way in kiddos on a on a string, kids train. Huh? You're laughing, this is done on the on the, on the, on like little leashes. Done in the US nowadays too. Easy way to keep you get your one your you get your body and your whole tight together. So you walk by, then you see you turn around you turn around and you see this. Huh? Fun fact, bicycle, yeah, that's the basement. We, just, we, know, we have seen that in, in the Midwest, yeah, in farmhouses. A, a scooter, interesting parking. <laughs> this is interesting parking. Fun fact, there are cities like the city of Berlin where the smart car came out. Because you can park like this, and you could park two smarts like this next to each other in the regular parking bay. They changed their parking ordinance to a small car parking spots, so they actually have two parking meters. Yeah? Because how do you deal with the parking meter and the parking meter in this case? Half a spot, paying half the price. Yeah? Or what if, if there are two cars, one paid for it, the other one, the guy who paid for it left, and the money is out. How do you deal with that? Oh no, I was parking on the left side, I was parking on the parking meter, we were looking at a different parking spot. Yeah? So they changed that. So I found this really interesting. This in pure downtown area, within literally around the corner from here. Like turn left and then see this. This is the plaza of the church at lunch. All these are restaurants and bars. 
this is like a uh, little market retailers around the church. Yeah? And here on top, you can see you slightly see the red sandstone again, which is the castle. And it took, uh, no, yeah. Former student of mine, this is the castle, that's the church down there. And I can see this is on the river. This is the, this is the church where I took the picture. No? So this is the castle. All is walking distance. Amazing, you just walk for, oh, eat, sit down, eat, drink. Um, not pictured in the picture here, the big Wiener Schnitzel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and, a, and a drink. But it's a different flair. It really invites you, hey, I want to check this out. This, uh, people are walking, they're nice. You know? um, two guys talking English. Not an unknown uh, exercise there. NATO headquarters used to be in Heidelberg in the 80s, 90s, before they moved to Wiesbaden. So they are experienced with uh, GIs and international customers. A lot of, lot of Asian and American uh, uh, um, tourists. Yeah? Then you walk by this one. I go, well, what's that? Again, this is, I got so much time, often, so often times in trouble and stepping into little passages like this in Berlin. Why? In Berlin, they do housing like this. You have a street. You have a whole street block, and you have courtyards. So it's somewhere you have those little passages, uh, bicycles, trash, laundry, everything, yeah. inside that courtyard. Because all of that is street sided, street facing, and then you have actually an interior courtyard. Yeah. So, ooh, this looks like a courtyard. Walk in, see some banners, and there's apparently some food. Beautiful. It's actually a little uh, French creperie shop with outdoor seating. Yeah. That was somewhat like a hot dog thing. These are apartments yeah. and a restaurant here, totally in the backyard. Again, look at the people. The scale of that little space. That's the classroom here is twice that space. By the way, this apartments, that stretch, highest rent levels in that town, in that region, because of walkability. According to my buddy who does real estate in that area, more commercial, you pay, change that, for about a thousand square foot. Four years, six years ago, you would pay about 2,500 euros. Cold, no utilities. So you in winter times, because it's old structure, this is old, really old, hundreds of years old, you end up probably with $3,000. Easy on that. That's not a condominium. That's a house that is hundreds and hundreds of years old. So different, but it's most central place in the town. Most central place in the town. The University is around the corner here. Yeah? Old historic town, beautiful place to live. Who's the guy? Peto. Used to be a real estate student. Met him on a dive boat, signed up for classes. Oh. Fun, yeah, really fun. We literally met through the dive club. And he's like, oh. Kind of masters in international business, or take real estate classes. So then he he sends me that picture, does an international trip, uh, sends me the picture, and it's like, who would have known that Dr. Wurzer has such a great backyard in this town? He did not tell us about the castle. I'm like, sure I did. Um, really beautiful. Uh, complete streets. Um, supposed to be in a video. What are complete streets? This is Community Planning 101. Complete streets are streets designed to be safe, comfortable, and efficient. This works for, for your trains, cyclists, transit riders, for and motorists. For your neighborhood. And they're designed to be connected to the places people live, work, learn, and play. Design features of complete streets may include sidewalks, multi-use trails, bike or bus lanes, accessible transit stops, median islands, and many others. And each of these helps one or more transportation method function better without making the others less efficient or uncomfortable. 
It's not about balancing the use of cars against all other transportation, or just adding lanes for bikes, buses, and pedestrians. It's about travel being more accessible and providing travel options for communities, making them better and healthier places to live. Also, the improved social interaction of complete streets is good for businesses and property values. Even where destinations are close to home, incomplete streets often make them inaccessible by foot, bike, or transit. For example, schools without sidewalks to residential areas make walking less safe for students, and cul-de-sacs create dead ends, cutting places off from people's homes. Routes along high-speed roads without bike lanes, sidewalks, or comfortable transit stops feel unsafe and are used less. Multi-lane roads without adequate crossings act as barriers, limiting access to retail areas and services. By designing complete streets, these negative impacts can be avoided or reversed. Complete streets are also not just city or suburban approaches. They can work in rural areas too, but the design solutions will look different. For example, roads in rural areas may be made complete by providing wide shoulders for cycling and walking, with connections to trails and transit stops. In a village center, a complete street strategy could include marked crossings, sidewalks, curb extensions, and street trees, all designed specifically to fit the character of the small town. So now you know the basics of what complete streets are, their benefits, and the kinds of ways they can be designed. I'm Robert Voigt, and this has been... Uh, yeah, there are like four or five little videos out there from this guy, and I like the way they put this thing together. It's like, he takes a minute in a video, which equals 90 minutes of a lecture. I'm like, yeah, let's put this in. But um, we had this city before. When we talk about historic developments over time, remember the squares where the, the castle changed because we didn't need to have defensible structures anymore? This is the same city. Yeah? Talking about complete streets on a sunny Sunday after, uh, Saturday afternoon. Streetcar, overhead for streetcar, trees, a little bit too high in my opinion, but you have people living, walking around all over the place. Yeah? It's a pedestrian zone. Well, this is one way to look at the street. Then you turn around and you see the street cut coming. <laughs> you know? They have like a big, yeah, big loud ring, like a ring, 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 ring. They're really nasty. They, they don't want to stop. They make loud noises and they are coming and coming and coming. You, you, you jump. You know? But literally, <coughs> turn around. This is the main shopping area. The castle is this way. Main shopping area. You turn around. You see one of the park features. And again, you take a look at people sitting and eating and drinking coffee and other foods. Yeah? Uh, this is the apartment store, but then on top of here you have apartments again. Look at the overall building height. The whole, the whole town is like this. It's like what? Three, six, that's it. Almost like a DC flare. Huh? Um, same thing here, same town. We had that already with historical view. Um, we did literally a, a big day, morning, Heidelberg, in the afternoon, high, uh, and Speyer. That's Friday afternoon, 5 p.m., something like this, just before dinner time. Look at how crowded that street is. You get run over by the bicyclists. They are really roughnecks. Unbelievable, unbelievable roughnecks. Uh, and then elbow out in worst case. But again, same structure here, totally busy. You can see the scale again, the Catholic cathedral in the background. Uh, people are there ready to go for ha happy hours, not really a thing that they thank God, thank, or the TGIF. It comes in a little bit, but again, it's a summer weekend. And then you find this guy. <laughs> so, fun fact. Talk to the guy and say, hey, I'm a professor for earth planning and real estate. I find this wonderful how you actually come up with the kid on the bicycle. May I take a picture for class for you? you tell him I'm teaching the US. He's like, yeah, but not with the face of the kid. Totally privacy paranoia in terms of photo releases and all that. So this is a rent, uh, it's actually staged. I actually approached them, can I take it? And then they reach out the second time. No? This is a ice cream drive through. Uh, I'll try by shooting pretty much for ice cream. But, uh, <laughs> you, walk, you walk by here, you walk by here, and the ice cream is there. Yeah. yeah, why not? 
quote me on this. Properly cited with reference. Huh? But again, this is a different neighborhood, different flair, different community. Huh? This is about walkability and biking in this case. Huh? And the whole thing about how we conceptualize complete streets in the US, this is one of the fundamental ideas. Huh? Well, it's like, well, that's a complete street too. Different, organically grown over thousands of years versus let's design this. Okay? So, again, new, yes, please. So, obviously, those are the layouts of like the old cities of Germany. How about when they're planning new zones and new areas? Are they moving towards the street designs like that in the US? Are they still doing? The whole complete streets thing is coming from the US architectural design. So, they're moving into that when they're They want to mimic that. Okay. Yeah. My, big, my biggest criticism when we talk about mixed use developments is it's, if it's purely artificially designed, how you engage that organic feel. Uh, um, at the master's level, um, and actually in market analysis, I actually have an article I present that call, calls out the question, where is the, where is the cafe? That little, tiny, little coffee shop there where you have people sitting outside all the time and from the community and they know each other. You walk by, they shout out your name because they know, they know you already. You know? Versus, think about this. Local Starbucks in a small neighborhood community. Huh? Versus Starbucks here on campus or the Starbucks at University Drive. You know, Starbucks here at University Drive next to Whole Foods. I don't see 60 year olds sitting out there having coffee and talking about that, uh, their last bike ride. Huh? Starbucks around the corner where I live. That's where they hang out after they did the community ride in the morning. Huh? Or where they actually come in, literally, people are meeting for business meets and sit outside. Matter of fact, six, eight people outside at 90 degrees in the shade in front of a coffee shop. Yeah? Because it's one of the very few coffee shops until you go really to a cafe. Yeah? Um, again, it comes back to the idea of what is the livelihood, livelihood in the neighborhood? How do you, how do, can you blend that? Right? Simple thing. If you go to Whole Foods, there are people sitting outside. There's the farmer's market option sometimes. You know? There's a different interaction. What was surprising for me, I got you for the question. What was surprising for me when I came into uh, Florida to Davy is there is this kind of typical traditional farmer's market somewhat missing. I haven't made it yet to the yellow or green market or what it's called. It's like one thing in Dania or Hollywood. You know? But it's not only a neighborhood corner. It's definitely not. There's a different culture. Like, some of the homeowner associations for that. They're like, you're, we are creating or we're growing up in this kind of sterile environment. You know? Where like, how would you teach someone to, buy, to cycle? Well, if right now, the more older population, I can. Well, my street I could, but the street around the corner where the community park is? Hallelujah! No, I'm not going to, not going to teach anyone bicycling on that street. It's a 30 zone and they're flying through 60. And really giving the light if you're 35. No, like, I live here. Uh, so does this answer your question? Yes. yes. Uh, I, you can see I'm engaged in this uh, because I'm just trying to present you guys with a different flair. Um, what was your question? Uh, I was going to say, like, have you seen Los Olas, like the downtown strip there? Like, they changed it up. Like, I think it was last year they added the, the bike lanes and the walk lanes. Yeah, this is a very interesting observation. Do a road trip through daily and plantation. Do it, just for the fun of it. Take yes, three, yeah. <laughs> take a few friends and really explore this. Plantation has surprisingly a really, really extensive marking of their bike lanes. Yeah, they are really strong at it because there's actually a very strong commu bicycling community on the race bikes. Like literally Sunday mornings, police car or, or police uh, 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 motorcycle, zoop, 40 cyclists, like a whole pedal. Yeah, 25, 30 miles per hour. And you're like, okay, I guess I get late to campus then. But that's the best traffic delay you can have. If 30 to 40 people are doing physical exercise and you get delayed for that, and your tax dollars, local tax, property tax dollars, are supporting that with law enforcement, yeah, why not? 
I, I don't care about the fitness cycling thing with what is called Pelican now, where you have the internet friends. No, you gotta eat some dirt and hit the black top. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about, huh? Yeah. Old cyclist. Yeah. So again, coming back. Theme through this whole class is scale. Yes, we can do scale, we can talk about all this renewable stuff. We have to deal with the site versus neighborhood versus city versus region. A regional renewable is a larger project. We saw the example in Sydney. Huh? Then just two or three townhomes. Definitely a different thing. Huh? Remember in the 80s, early 90s, the public perception of Miami? Remember that? What was the public perception of Miami? Killings on the street. Famous case as in German couple, rental car gets head, uh, gets uh, um, rear-ended. They get out of the car because they want to deal with the accident, with the, stop, with the uh, accident and it uh, damages. Uh, they ended up being shot. Fun fact, I bring up this example last Saturday in class. Uh, the guy who can exactly remembers the name of the neighborhood and the, the date of this incident. Because he was at that time in the Miami. Well, so different perception. Perception of New York City is different from LA. Kansas City. Huh? Sin City, yeah, what's well, Sin City? Las Vegas. Yeah. Yeah? So keep that in mind. Scale is the important part when we talk about redo, renewal, resilience, or even rebuilt. Resilience is more in the cultural context here of being resistant to the changes and then rebuild and preserve. Huh? Uh, fun fact story. Deliver what you promised. I kind of try to give you this flair of um, land development here um, in a broader perspective. Yeah, that's the reason why we changed also the textbook this year. Um, less finance, a little bit more the channel idea to actually say, okay, fine, future property managers, future real, real estate developers have some flavors from there outside world. Deliver what you promise means if you tell me this is going to be my development, make sure that you keep the promise and stay with that development plan. Okay? Those are examples from my old planning law class. Uh -huh. Adelaide Commons, it's in Ohio. Uh -huh. That's good enough. Alright, so what we see here, nice site plan, nice circulation, yeah? Nice bridge to enter as a gateway, circulation here, the parking lots, great trees, big anchors, yeah? retail area A, neighborhood retail area across, and then the out parcels here, office and research. Really nice, huh? Love it. I was told there's actually sarcasm, a special form for sarcasm, I can't find it yet, but detailed sketch. That's a little bridge here. Huh? Really nice detailed bridge, intersection, intersection, intersection. See the pattern here, change. Huh? You have here a gateway welcome. Very nice. Great sketch here too. Huh? Very welcoming. Oh, this looks like a really nice walkable neighborhood slash mall. I want to go there. I want to shop there. I want to swipe my credit card. Anyone, anyone interested yet? Maybe. Deliver what you promised. Nice landscaping, nice beautiful shade trees here. Yeah, really nice, interesting uh, setback architecture, different patterns in, uh, on the building side. Deliver what you promised. Uh, that's a dream. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the that's the water feature of my company. <laughs> Huh? Uh, that's the, that's the, uh, the sidewalk. <laughs> nice backdrop. <laughs> uh, it's beautiful. It's fantastic. Hashtag. Wow. Yeah, this is this water feature. This is the welcoming water feature. Look at that tree. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <the> <laughs> Huh? 
So they get in trouble for that? Like, no, they don't. That's the problem. It's a sketch. It's a problem. But it's, it's supposed to look like a scale. sketch. This is what you present in a planning and zoning meeting. This is what we want to develop. And this is what you deliver. It's not to scale. The trees are. Oh, but well, look, this is a red pattern, beautiful pattern change. It's pedestrian friendly bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Deliver what you promise. Deliver what you promise. Beautiful little shaded park, resting space, yeah? pagodas and all that. Neat, neat, neat uh, arches here over the, uh, what do you call it, the door, uh, awnings. <laughs> you don't have to be in forestry. <laughs> Do you understand that these are different trees from that? <laughs> you know, cost. Huh? Yeah, this is a shade tree. This is a Christmas attempt. Yeah. Huh? They really had to cut corners. <laughs> okay, you guys, are you watching anything? You have not looked at those slides all evening long. Apparently, on your computer, I'm not even taking notes. I wonder what you really do. If you don't like my lecture, do something different. And I record that, I hope you watch this. This is exam relevant stuff. Huh? If I attack you, don't, I don't want to attack you, but if I make that note in a different way, misunderstood, I apologize for that. But I have a highly engaged group. I have folks sitting in front of their laptops and watching straight into the laptop. That's, that's insulting for your own education. I just pointed out. All right. Hi. Let's go back to what you promised. Oh, I see the clock yeah, tower now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> Doesn't work. That's the joke. Huh? Doesn't really work. Again, we heard in a little video about Philadelphia that Ed Bacon was the PR manager for that story. He delivered that. Huh? Talk to Paul and the Shakish folks. They are doing those pitches. They need to have, they have two minutes to sell what they want to do for four years in college. Yeah? What did you do? I did it for the MT shop. He did four different proposals until he finally got, got yeah. that thing. You do this, now you do the well, funding one. Yeah? So, really extremely important, you have to tell the story the right way. But also, you need to deliver the implementation the right way. Yeah? As humorous as those slides are, you know, it's tragic. Because next time you, that developer comes to town for the planning and zoning approval, what are you going to tell? If you're a really engaged community, you're like, no, no. The guy I was referring to earlier, board member of mine, you know, highly engaged in the community. He delivers what he promises. That's the reason why he has a record in actually getting everything through the planning and approval process. Like where in Fort Lauderdale you wait for a year to get everything done, he, the city of Pebble Pines helps him to get things done because they know it delivers high-end promises and holds them. Huh? So that's about it for Urban Renewal. Oh. Ah, we're not going to get through all of that, but at least some of this. I want to give you a break like 9.30. Give me 20 more minutes. Huh? Okay. So we're back here, break. break. Oh, no. Yes, please. Was it? Oh, no, it was the no. break. No, I literally put this in the slide. If I forget to look at the time, to make sure that you guys have this. All right. So. We talk about innovative zoning overlays and ideas and concepts. One of the elements that this has been presented in the past are purchased development rights. Yeah? There's also TDR, transferable development rights. Yeah? Think about that. One is a swap, the other one is a transaction. Pay for it. Both are really cool models when it comes, let's say, in the areas of Maryland, Virginia, Delaware, for historic preservation of land. How do you, do, how do you deal with development pressure? 
as in people want to buy land and houses, but preserve historically grown meadows and farmland as part of your cultural plan for the state. Yeah? Delaware is a small state, you can do that. That's like Fort Lauderdale down to, uh, to Homestead, that's pretty much the whole state. It takes 90 minutes to drive from north to south, maybe two hours with traffic, that's it. It's, it's a fun place. Yeah? So, for PDR, the primary purpose is the preservation of land. Both concepts, TDR and PBR, work as well in concepts with land banking, where a county or a state would actually start buying land, but also giving the development rights away. As in, if you're allowed to build 10 units of residential dwelling units on the acre, why don't you save the acre and I give you the 10 units on the other acre? So now you build 20 units on one, but you preserve the other area and don't touch it. Never ever touch it. If that is, let's say, Amish land, beautiful little farm, beautiful little uh, historic preservation and landscape, boom. Sounds great. Someone actually needs to do the transaction for you. Uh, so that's the reason why some governments are involved in that. Fundamental idea, public action, no development, property owner retains all the other rights. You own the land but you gave the right way to develop on it. Could be extreme if you decide now I want to put two homes on there, duplexes for the family. Done, it's gone. That right to develop that house, that building is gone. Yeah? But again, depending on the culture of your region, very important concept. Yeah? And again, the cost and how much is enough, how much do you pay for that development right? We have seen this in farm areas where the farm stop being, uh, being occupied, being used, because there's no heritage, no one wanted it, and then basically said, okay, fine, here, give it away. Levies are organized like this as well, like on, on big rivers, because they cut, cut down like once or twice a year in the grass, everything else is white grown, yeah? but the farmer actually gets compensated for the services, but not anymore for the land, because they stop uh, maintaining it as agricultural land. Different regions, different concepts, but keep in mind purchase development rights versus TDR, transfer of development rights. Now, again, here, this is a public action, no development, think restoration. Here, TDR, I'm shifting development rights between involved parties. Could be still a state, but you're shifting a density away. Ever played Risk? Yes. Game Risk? Yes. What are you going to do if you don't have any more fives and tens? Stack them up. Yeah? You can come up and take legal blocks and say, these are 100 units now. Something like this. You combine your forces into one larger development. You put all the armies of your Risk at the gateway between South America and Africa. Yeah? Silly example, but you move your development rights among those different parties. Yeah? And even can deal with density bonus. A smart city manager will talk to you about that. As in, so what could we do? Would you be interested in 10 more units? And you're like, yeah, cash flow with rental apartments. If you present the proper development rights and the proper legal background. All right, it is complicated to organize. And the book here as well is very short, ridiculously short for these two concepts. Again, might not be completely applicable for our local region, but it's a really cool tool to have and to know. All right, the M. Could you go back just one second? Yeah, just Sorry. The M word, moratorium. Ah, got it? I can share that slide with you. Okay, yeah, thanks, sorry. It's in the book too. Yeah, you're good. I'm I lost good. my book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, me, let me roll this. Let me roll this, otherwise we're not going to get you guys to the early rolls. 
Uh, moratoria, moratorium. Um, Latin, as in moment, hold, stop. Uh, hold a moment. Uh, hold your horses. Um, really interesting thing. If you are beyond your potential capacity as a planning staff as a city because you have so many applications pending, your staff might call for a moratorium. As in, we cannot process any more paperwork. Let's stop accepting new applications and fit, deal with whatever is in the pipeline and get that done. We've seen this in uh, around the 2000s a lot because development popped up all over the place and small towns just did not have the human capital to deal with all of that. And it actually stopped accessing or uh, processing. Which is also interesting, moratorium has a time limit. Cannot be extended typically. Yeah? Uh, has a specific time frame, allows you to work on certain codes or regulations and your pipeline. Um, famous Last few cases is the um, Lake Tahoe, Tahoe versus um, we cover that next week as a short example. Tahoe Sudum Sudum developer versus Tahoe Regional Planning Agency. Um, interesting case back then is they called up for a moratorium, but they actually have been. There have been issues about the procedure. Remember the beginning of this uh, class today, when we talked about administrative process? They have been lacking administrative process and timing, and therefore they got sued. Because you know? they did not follow that due process, administrative due process. Oh, why is this? This is the same slide we had before. Remember? In sum, Talk it says in some constitutional principles on public actions and laws. Again, how do we define the policing powers to govern? Yeah? Policing powers as in governing for zoning and policing. It's built on due process amendment 14 and taking of property fifth amendment. Yeah? Speaking of amendments and takings. Private restriction of ownership. I will do that next week. But right now it's a handwritten script. I want to give you some more graphics. Huh? This is very important in the context of CCR, CCNRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions, and means and easement. Remember when I talked that I'm able as an owner, as a developer, to write lawful restrictions into your deed. It's an HOA, right? And out of that, an HOA can be created and executes those rights. Yeah? I can sue you for this. It's lawfully enforceable in front of the court with what is in your deed. Yeah? I can put building design into that CCL and all the little tricks. I can tell you to avoid pink flamingos in your front yard. Written into your deed that's the two pieces of paper that define your property and your ownership. It's not a contract. If you sell the house, it's in the deed. Huh? The way you paint your house, the paint, the way, everything that you know from a homeowner association, in short, I could write into a CCNR and put it in your deed. Very intriguing. Huh? Um, we'll skip that for next week. I want to make sure I give you a little bit more graphics to keep you awake. All right. So we started out. We started out this lecture today with constitutional rights. And the Fifth Amendment talks about takings. Yeah? There was this line of eminent domain and all that. Eminent domain is the final goal for tomorrow. So, when I talk about takings, we talk about a physical innovation of your private property. That's one way to describe it. We also describe it as the loss of beneficial use, the economic means. Remember that this is phrasing the economic means of your property, partially or completely. 
That's the important part. Partially and or completely economic means. As in, if your property floods once or twice a year for a month of total time, you uh, still have the economic means of dealing with your property. Huh? If, I think I have this slide, if I build a dam and I flood your property 365 days a year, I'm pretty sure you have a loss of beneficial use. You can't put cows in 30 feet of water depth. Doesn't I work that way. Huh? We can try it <laughs> once. All right, so for the next few slides, we're talking about the famous taking cases, where some restriction and some miserable uh, happenings happen to your land, and how the Supreme Court decided upon that. Huh? Early and important cases. This is the reason why I put that up is because the book names it. Hellachek. Hellachek versus the city of Sebastian. Really interesting case. Uh, as you can see, it's old, 104 years old. <clears throat> there was this guy who did actually have a brickyard, and they decided they sold this out as a permissible use. Huh? Remember, you can name what the uses are possible or not. Huh? So they convicted Hedacek for misdemeanor of the violation of the city ordinance which prohibited the establishment of operations of a brickyard huh? or any manufacturing of burning bricks described in the city limits. Catch this, they kind of annexed him in. Huh? They literally dealt with this. He had this manufacturing in place already and the city decided, well, we're taking part of your property and we call it now a city. Typical grove of the city. Huh? We decide, okay, incorporated land at some point of time will be annexed in and you provide city services and therefore you get property taxes. So, that happened in that case. It ended up as in, the city still who over won this case, the police power is once, in, is once the most essential and least limited powers of government and therefore the regulation is not taking and it's done in the public interest. Yeah? So the city actually won that. Decided, okay, this is a use that is not permissible anymore. Very confusing if you do three pages of law in one slide. Lessons learned from this case. The legal environment and the physical form of a city can change over time. Land users and businesses do the same. Sometimes they clash and they go to court. Yeah? But it was an interesting decision in 1915 based on the uses of land within the powers of a city. Yeah? Again, governmenting body versus the land use. At that time, zoning was not defined yet for parcel-based use. That's important in element. Zoning, as we know it, was defined in a case later. This one is for fun, um, because mm, Molly, you mentioned air rights. Mm -hmm. That's the reason why I put that up. So, 1922, Pennsylvania Coal Company in Reservoir Hood huh, talked about the surface rights and the coal mining rights. And if I remember right, without looking at my notes, ended up pretty much that the guy actually argued that they gave them rights to mine the land, but he was damaged in the, in the property, etc. Typical case as a dig under your house and there's something your house bursts. Thanks. So if you own a house, you can technically sell your like subsurface rights, right? That somewhat is based on this one. Okay. Depends on the state. state yeah. Depends on the state. The state of Idaho reserves all the mineral mining rights underneath your property. So they can only take it find if they find the gemstones and diamonds, yeah. Well, not diamonds, but any, any other right. Yeah. Remember, it's gold. There are gold towns there. They yeah. actually grow, find gold in Idaho. So do they compensate you for taking your property? Like, they give you... Well, what, what constitutes a taking? Taking is the physical nation or the economic means, change of your economic means of the property. Yeah, so let's say they find these rare gemstones or whatever. Well, then you go into just compensation or, um, just com compensation. or, or compensation in general, which is the issue of eminent domain. 
and what what's the rate for compensation then? Yeah? So rule it there. But so this year was probably taking a regulatory power. They decided, okay, the coal mining rights recognize a separate estate from the surface development rights. Yeah? The idea is coal is not necessarily sitting 10 feet underneath the house. It's deeper, depending on the coal. Yeah? And he pretty much granted that company the rights. Did retreat from that, and the company is like, no, we've got the rights for that. We are lawfully embedded in here. Yeah? Um, but also, they argued that technically it's a taking. So this is confusing. Yeah? It's a physical invasion of your property, under, underneath your property, and it's somewhat a diminishing uh, economic means. So yes, it's taking, but still the mining company won that case because of the mining rights. I put that up because it could be interesting to see how air rights are now going to be dealt with. Um, the example of the um, Bright Line Station, they used air rights in that concept for the real estate valuation. As in, well, we're not building 40 floors high, but the property valuation should be actually considering we are able to build 40 feet high, uh, 40 floors high. Even if we only build 10 feet, or 10, 10 floors high. Give us the 30, as a property right, air rights, in the valuation of the property, therefore our equity is different, therefore our lending concept is different, we can actually borrow more money. A little you blow up the valuation. You literally like a balloon. Like put something in it. Huh? So I thought this is an example that's coming. Do they this forever have the rights to build? Like let's say in that property they decide to knock down a 10 story building, they still have the right if they want to rebuild up to 40 stories. If yeah, the zoning ordinance doesn't change in an adequate time frame. Okay. Time frame is here always. So this is a fun thing. This is like me, one of the first cases I had when I came to the US. This is fun. This is 1946. Yeah. Cosby sued the United States for trespassing on its land, complaining <laughs> about how. Yeah. This is perfect for 925. Are you okay? No. Apparently not, because I'm talking about chicken, and you're laughing before I'm talking about the chicken. <laughs> she heard Cosby. <laughs> no, it's the chicken. The fact that he's suing because it's scaring the chicken. Oh, yeah. He was a farmer. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Let, me, let me read this. This is awesome. <laughs> huh? Cosby. <clears throat> not Cosby. Cosby. Cost. Due to the US, United States for trespassing on his land. Trespassing. We're talking about airplanes. <laughs> no? Complaining specifically about how, quote, low flying military planes caused the plaintiff's chicken to jump up against the side of the chicken house and the walls and burst themselves open and die. What? Yes. <laughs> Correct. Sounds like you can do Like, I don't know how many chicken, but chicken can. Panic a lot. All right. But can they make themselves explode? Probably was Nobody can't. She can't panic herself. Right? Yeah. 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 So the plaintiffs yeah. sued the government, arguing that they were entitled, they were entitled to compensation under the takings clause of the Fifth Amendment. Yeah. The court's decision, offered by Justice William Douglas, cool. could, could, could have resolved the case on a narrow ground by simply holding that there was a taking of land because the government's flight affected the land. It's like here, you work on campus and suddenly you have a 737 running over your head. It's like, first week on campus, hello freshman, uh -huh. <laughs> second week of campus, and eh, what type of flight is that? Ah, that's a 5 p.m. spirit. Uh -huh. so. So, if the landowner, this is the conclusion part, if the landowner is to have full enjoyment of the land, he must have exclusive control of the immediate reaches of the enveloping atmosphere. Wow. Stuff over you. We're not talking about stratosphere and space shuttle, but <laughs> the immediate space around it. Otherwise, buildings could have not be could not be erected, trees could not be planted, and even fences could not not be run. But we're talking about certain scale. Again, scale is important. Yeah? So, thus, the landowner, this is, again, this is a quote from the legal text, 
Thus, a landowner owns at least as much of the space above the ground as he can occupy or use in connection with the land. An invasion, an invasion of such airspace are in the same category as invasions of the surface. As in, I grew up in an area where you would end up with an amphibious vehicle from the French army suddenly in your backyard or running across uh, the farmland. Yeah? Ex NATO area. Maneuvers, you suddenly have an American tank in, uh, in your cornfield yeah? running over the irrigation piping. <laughs> they pay well. We, we, had, we had a chat once during Sonic Boom over our village and the windows broke. Within three days, all the windows have been replaced. And they paid well back then. Huh? And, of course, the chicken won. Ooh. So, huh? we can to the airport, right? Because we're not able to stay outside. Uh, He's pre law. <laughs> Talk to him. Huh? Uh, again, it's absurd. You think chicken. Huh? But here, the reasoning was it's the full enjoyment of the land, actually, here, full enjoyment and use of the land of the property owner. Huh? So now you know where we're going with this. We're going in reverse. Flooding to a canal. Issues, property taking. I kind of told you guys that already a little bit. Yeah? The guy didn't lose, didn't win. Sorry. Water bodies sometimes flood because of the canal. Yes, but they did not take all of the taking uh, of the um, harm. Yeah, they were not able to demonstrate the full direct and indirect harm for a full me economic means of the property. Again, the question is then: Take so this is partially economic means, not full. So partially is okay, full is not okay. So two years later, we talk about this. This is where the term Euclidean zoning is coming from. A zone per property per parcel. Exclusively, one zone for one parcel. Overly zoning came later again. Huh? This is the parcel-based, land-based zoning. <coughs> Short story here, they actually had different density, different building heights in there with different setbacks. Yeah? This is Euclid Avenue, the main street. This, part, this property here, the guy at Marilty argued, because of the different zoning densities they imposed as stretches here, he would have a reduction in land value. Again, the economic means of the property to the full, full enjoyment of the land uses available on that property. It's like the vision, this guy is repeating all the time, means of economic property. Economic means of the property. Huh? So the argument here was the due process was prohibited and not really done right. Huh? And it would be a property taking. As in, could be a physical invasion or the economic means and purposes of the property have been diminished, aka being taken away. Huh? The city actually won that. And since ever then we're talking about Euclidean sorting, since ever then we say, okay, the ruling or the holding was diminished value of property is not necessarily constitute a complete taking. Because there was a reduction, again partial, of the value and not a complete. So huh? you would have had to reduce the value to zero for them to have anything infringed upon it? Well, that would be a different case, but let's say, like this, if you still, instead of $400,000 homes, you sell a house for $300,000, you're still making money on that property. Yeah, so I'm saying, like, yeah. they have to make it like, either unlivable or yeah. unusable. But again, this is very interesting also because I said here yeah, the argument here was they came again in the health and safety of the uh, uh, community. Question. Yes, please. Uh, the city, I was in high school in. Um, there's like two main streets, kind of. I know the person was in the corner house. And the 
city came in and said we're widening the, sh the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, so we're taking part of your yard. Mm -hmm. But the city ended up losing. The city ended up losing? Yeah, so like my friends have, because like they fought it. Um, yeah, it goes in the, in the idea again of eminent domain, passage of ways and right of ways. Yeah. But how does like, how would eminent domain not take over there? Good question. <laughs> Give me five minutes or next week. Okay. Huh? <laughs> next week, probably. Let's do next week. Start fresh with three usual suspects Nolan, Do Do Nolan Lucas, and Dolan. As in Nolan, Luke Nolan Dolan, Lucas. Those are the three major beachfront property takings. We can build on. Midterms. You can keep them. Well, I keep them. I don't care. 